Okay, um, hello everyone and welcome to our press conference on human rights defenders and their lived online and offline realities in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, apologies for the delay uh, due to technical difficulties, so thank you so much for sticking around with us. My name is Marwa Fatafta and I lead Access Now's uh, work in the Middle East and North Africa region as the MENA policy manager. Um, in recent years, we have been witnessing unprecedented levels of repression and attacks on human rights defenders, journalists, lawyers, um, civil society organizations and activists um, in the region from extrajudicial killings to um, pretrial detentions, harassment, smear campaigns and the denial of basic rights. Uh, many governments in the region have shown brutal vindictiveness uh, against those who dare to rise up and speak truth to power, often with anti-fake news legislations or cyber crime laws. Um, to highlight some of the freedom of expression issues and the online and offline realities of internet freedom in the region, I'm extremely honored to moderate the conversation um, originally with three remarkable and brave women um, activists whom I deeply admire and respect for the courageous and crucial work that they do and um, who will share with us uh, stories from the ground uh, with a special focus on Tunisia and um, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. So I'd like to welcome our speaker, Emna Mizouni. Um, she's a Tunisian activist and digital communications expert. She's also a board member of Access Now. Um, we also had with us uh, Lina Atalla, the co-founder and chief editor of Mada Masr, and Lina Al Hadloul, uh, a Saudi lawyer and activist and the sister of uh, women rights defender Lujain Al Hadloul, but unfortunately we lost them um, due to last minute circumstances. Uh, before I give the floor to uh, our only speaker for today, Amna, uh, let me quickly run you through how we're organizing the session. Um, so we'll give the floor to Amna uh, to share uh, her experiences and talk about the situation of human rights defenders in Tunisia, but also uh, more widely in the region um, for 15 minutes. And then we'll open the floor for questions, uh, questions and answers from the audience. So please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box uh, on the platform. We'll be collecting those and um, answer your questions later on um, in the session. Also, uh, please note that this is a, a public session, so and it will be later streamed on YouTube. So please feel free to tweet or share on your social media uh, channels. Um, so without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Emna to introduce yourself and then go directly into the conversation. Sure, thank you so much. Um, it's a huge pleasure for me to be part of you today. Um, actually, to be part of this experience, um, first as a board member of Access Now, but also as a, um, an admirer of the interesting and amazing work that the Access Now team is doing globally and in our region as well. Uh, so thank you very much for making this right going to happen. Uh, thank you very much for shedding light on the importance of the situation um, of the activists in the MENA region. Um, and to this, I would move to, instead of presenting myself, I would say I'm just an activist, I'm a citizen of Tunisia. Um, and I'm very, very eager on following what is happening in the region, not only in my country. And I would, um, I would like to talk about um, the situation. Let's take it from, uh, like the general aspect of it. The situation is we've been uh, part of a tremendous change in the last 10 years, a change um, in the society, economy, um, at regional basis. It's like at the regional level, there is a huge change um, between countries, the relations between them, but also there is something very, very important. We're now more relying on um, tech platforms uh, and on digital. So that is somehow is shifting our life as we knew it um, 10 years ago to something very new. Uh, something that we used, for example, in Tunisia, we relied on um, the use of Facebook, for example, uh, to circulate and uh, relay the information um, and the news about the 
uprising in Tunisia. Uh, now we're facing a new way of change within the policies of Facebook, within the way of communication between the government and the people and people between themselves, citizens, citizens between themselves in using those platforms. Um, so the situation is not very different in other countries. Um, as activists, we rely on the ground a lot. We do activities on the ground, but also we rely on the digital platforms, which makes something, a platform like RightsCon, a very important place to debate and discuss what's happening in um, online and offline, because they are like very linked. Um, so that I would like to go into specific examples from, uh, from Tunisia and, um, and go to the region. But from Tunisia, let's start with a very recent um, case, an attack on someone who shared um, a sarcastic uh, post on Facebook. Now we're seeing like bloggers, they're no longer those who are holding blogs, but those who are even posting on Facebook in Tunisia and other uh, countries as well. A blogger called Emna Shargi has been um, targeted for her views, for being uh, skeptical and for making fun, I quote, for making fun of the religion of a um, the verses of the Quran. She literally used the same way of the Quran um, to write down a sarcastic a text for Corona, about the coronavirus. Um, that led to a huge attack on her. Um, and it went out from the social media, from Facebook to the court, to a life threat to her, uh, to herself and her family. This is the situation. Um, and this is not an isolated um, situation because if we move to people who uh, don't share the same views as ourselves, who are posting about politics or certain uh, views um, on social media, they are targeted. Those who are uh, taking uh, the streets for certain topics, they are targeted for that. Um, and we've seen a lot of hate campaigns. We've seen a lot of um, targeted campaigns that went from the offline, from sorry, from the online to the offline. So this is the current situation. I could give another example um, of a friend of mine, a colleague um, who was part of a movement, a political movement in Tunisia. He was the speaker, um, the communications person of that movement, and they went into um, into the parliamentarian elections, he was targeted. Um, and now if you Google his name, Hamza Kabar, on Facebook, you would find up to 3,000 posts attacking him. This is the situation right now. It's disinformation. Um, it's misinformation, of course. Um, and um, that is a huge topic to talk about. But targeting people for their activism is a constant reaction to everybody taking the civic space and this is so alarming if we rely on um the gain of tunisia's revolution and if we say that um we gained freedom of expression we gained freedom of speech and media uh, unfortunately this is not the case really because if we take those cases uh they're not individual cases they are very significant um, those are people that I know about. Those are people who are who um, who had the chance to have people defending them or talking about them. But there are other people they were arrested and put in prison from six months up to two years for the sake of revealing information or talking about certain topics, political topics in Tunisia. So this is the situation right now. It's no longer really that freedom of expression. Um, and if we take the if we take the gender aspect of it, if you're a woman, you're targeted. If you take the civic space, if you um, speak out, um, and I would give the the example of the late uh, Lina Bin Hindi, who was um, like during her lifetime. I think since she was nominated um, to the Nobel Peace Prize she was under constant threat for her views. 
Um, so this is one of the situations that we talk about um, not enough, unfortunately. And if we go out from Tunisia and see other countries from the region, I would jump to Saudi Arabia because this is a very um, important case for myself. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have Lina al today with us to talk about it, but I'll raise the topic of uh, Lujain al-Hadloul, who's been tortured in prison. She's been in uh, detention for more than two years right now. No news about her for the last two months, knowing that COVID-19 is in Saudi Arabia. She's likely to have it in prison. We have no idea, no update about her. Um, but if I put it into, um, into context, let's say, Lujain was arrested for one reason, for speaking out, uh, for using her fame, being a social media influencer to, um, to raise the issues and talk about the issues targeting women, um, women's rights in Saudi Arabia, violence against women, uh, the male guardianship, um, and of course, the right to drive. When they were granted the right to drive, she was behind the bars and she was subject to torture, and she was subject to a smearing campaign, not only uh, during her detention, but way before. I guess one of the people who received the highest number of death threats um, and, um, and other disgusting, let's say, messages from the people, like um, very, very um, disrespectful type of messaging and smearing, was Lujain al for her activism, her peaceful activism, and she was using the online platforms. Um, so this is the way, if we are um, talking about our work, if we're the, like not only talking, but if we're highlighting certain topics, we're subject to threats, we're subject to attacks. And this is, I would say, this is becoming very um, institutionalized. Um, it's not only attacks from uh, unknown people, it's not only hate campaigns online, but it goes to arrest, like detention, arresting the activists. And we have plenty of, the, um, of examples from the region. It's so unfortunate that we have brilliant people and brilliant activists who are able to um, live up this region to a better place. However, they're detained. Um, we can give plenty of examples. Um, other than Lujain al-Hadloul, a lot of women and amazing men, they are detained in Saudi Arabia for their views. Um, not only Saudi Arabia, if we take the example of Egypt, um, and again, unfortunately, we don't have Lina Atallah with us, but Egypt, they have plenty of people behind the bars for the sake of speaking up. It's not acceptable, I guess. Um, their countries are losing them. We're losing faith in the system if we um, continue in having this situation. Um, lately, um, one of the biggest cases that I think even The Guardian wrote about this um, is uh, the TikTok girls in Egypt. Random girls who are not activists, just girls using TikTok they are sentenced to two years with, um, with a fine up to 300k Egyptian pound. It's insane. For what reason for the family values? Is that a, like a context? Um, there is a kind of um, a big fear from the systems, I guess, um, toward those activists and those social media influencers. So we're facing um, those very, very organized um, campaigns online to, um, to smear all the activists and people who have different views. Um, and at the same time, uh, we're facing um, legal uh, threats as well. So this is quite the situation around the, the region. Um, this is from the side of the activists, but also those who are talking about, for example, let's say the example of um, misinformation. If you're uh, talking about misinformation, you would find a lot of people uh, shutting you up, um, a little bit of um, 
if non in some cases uh, cooperation uh, with the platforms between the platforms I mean uh, mainly Facebook and, uh, and Twitter as the biggest platforms that we use in this region um, and their policies with the civil society so if we're not heard um, if we're not in the table if we're not discussing policies if we're not uh, highlighting and flagging the situation and those targeted uh, campaigns against activists I guess this tweet will follow that starts online and it follows um, offline and there is like I would say the legal aspect I'm not an expert in the legal aspect but I rely a lot on um, on my colleagues and especially on the views of access now and this um, it's very important to highlight that the legal uh, system um, is not cooperative or at least the existing text right now they're not very um, in our favor uh, when I say our favor, I mean activists. Um, it would be good to hear um, other experts and other activists from the region, other journalists talking about the situation. But it's also very, very good to engage in a discussion like that, uh, to denounce. Um, and as any misinformation, any smearing campaign would start online, I believe our role as activists is to counter that. Um, to report those uh, hate tweets or posts or comments, our role is to denounce this, um, to come together as activists, um, forget about the, our different backgrounds and come all together to denounce this and um, speak for, uh, for the others who are unfortunately behind the bars. Thank you so much, uh, Amna, for sharing the different stories. Um, and I know that uh, there are too many cases to cover, but I want to pick on something that you've shared that I really love, is that often human rights defenders that are persecuted in our region, they're often portrayed as, as victims of brutal, senseless regimes, which is true in a way, but they're also brilliant minds that we are, we're losing in our communities. And I, you know, I, I mean, look no further at the case of Ali Abdel Fattah, who is an Egyptian human rights defender, activist, blogger, and also an active member of our community and who has been part of the RightsCon um, series um, in, in, since I think the beginning, since 2011. And unfortunately, he's currently behind bars right now. Um, Ali has been uh, arrested under almost every president in his lifetime. So he was arrested under the presidency of Hosni Mubarak, then later on um, Hamad Mursi, and currently now in also under the Sisi regime. Um, he served a sentence for five years and um, upon his release, he was also asked to serve another five years of having to check in at a police station every single day from 6 p.m. until 6, 6 a.m. Um, and unfortunately, last year in September 2019, he was detained again. And since the start of the pandemic, COVID-19, his family has lost also connection uh, to him. Uh, in March, um, they haven't been able to provide him with uh, necessary medical and hygiene and food supplies. They haven't been able to communicate with him either by sending uh, letters to the prison or receiving letters from him and he has been uh, or was on hunger strike in April um, and uh, the situation continues. Uh, the same story with Lujain Al Hadloul, also his, who is spending time. Um, unfortunately, right now, we also don't know much about her situation and she has been subject to uh, torture and sexual harassment in the prison and given the, uh, the situation of, of the prisons in, in our region um, and I would say the, the inhumane conditions, it's really scary during the COVID-19 pandemic um, to just imagine what, what is happening uh, of the spread of the disease and the fact that those people don't have access to information on how to protect themselves on the disease, on how their families are doing. And one of the reasons why we wanted to do this press conference is that often we are faced um, with this, this press fatigue that we know these stories, you know, we know the story of Ala Abdel Fattah, we know the story of what's happening in Tunisia and what's happening in the Middle East. And there is this um, 
uh, fatigue about covering the same story again and again. But what we want to emphasize here that these are stories of real people. Um, the, the suffering of the families is real, whether it's the story of Lejeune, and we really would have loved to have her sister with us to share um, the, the story of the family, and also the same with, with the family of Ali Abdel Fattah, and also the families of thousands of others uh, who are serving terms in prison um, and on, on false charges, um, and they, they shouldn't be in prison in the first place. I mean, also to add to Alia's case, um, his sister Sana is also currently detained um, just for the exercise of waiting outside with her mother, outside of the prison authorities, waiting to hear to receive a letter from Alia. They've been going to the prison on a daily basis and um, rather than listening to their um, demands um, and, and implementing these fundamental basic rights, um, the Egyptian authorities, they have actually been harassed. They have been um, uh, brutally attacked by female thugs. It's also a tactic used by the Egyptian regime to intimidate activists, um, you know, without leaving fingerprints of their security apparatus. Um, and then on the next day, when they wanted to go to the public prosecutor's office to file a, a complaint, um, Sana Saif has been detained or actually kidnapped by a civilian uh, by men in civilian clothing pushed into a van uh, and driven away only to appear later in front of the same office, the public prosecutor's office, detained on charges related to misuse of social media, spreading misinformation and fake news about COVID-19 and inciting to terrorism. Again, going to the point you mentioned regarding how legislations in the region, in many countries in the region, obviously it, it differs from one country to the other, but there is that trend and pattern of using anti-fake news and cyber crime laws and incitement to violence and terrorism to um, uh, silence people and silence activists. And unfortunately, it's no longer about activists anymore. As you mentioned, the, the case of the TikTok girls, um, many governments in the region are um, appointing themselves as the moral police of people and uh, exercising an authority to tell individuals what should be said and what shouldn't be said um, on social media and on in the internet based on very vague values such as family values or um, good ethics and, and public order and, and, and so on. I'll stop here and I'll open the floor for uh, your questions and, um, and then I think we have about 10-15 minutes so I will look to see if there are any questions. All right. I may add something uh, very important to what you were saying. Um, it's We're not talking about those examples as the only examples like in Nashergi or Hamza Kabar or Eugene Katlou or Ali Abdel Fattah, which is a very, very famous case. But those are people who are known to us, known to the international community or the national community. But they hide hundreds of other people across the region who are detained. And if we're speaking um, and using their names, on behalf of them, I guess, we're highlighting the issue of the activists across the region. If we're asking to free Lujain and Hadlul, for example, we're not asking only for Lujain, but the other women activists like Samar Badawi or Naseema Seda in Saudi Arabia. Um, if we're asking about Ala Abdel Fattah, we're asking about every other person in Egypt who is detained for no reason. Uh, who is simply detained because either posting on Facebook or using TikTok as a random person um, or a person who was kidnapped. Um, there is plenty of cases in Egypt um, that we're using those names as symbols. Uh, they are our symbols um, to address um, hate campaigns and to address um, disinformation. Um, and also torture and sexual violence against uh, detainees. And one of the important uh, questions to put here, um, how they are coping with the COVID-19 in prisons. 
How is the hygiene over there? Um, in the case, uh, in the case of Eugenie Hadloul and the other Saudi activists detained, it's a big question mark because we lost connection. At least the family of Eugenie lost her connection for the last two months. No phone calls. Before that, there was only one phone call, and before that, it was a month without no news. Knowing that since the pandemic started, they stopped the in-person visits. So it's a lot of big question marks. And again, we should not stop. Our role as activists is not to stop talking about those cases and denounce those practices of threats, smearing campaigns, disinformation against activists, and also to call on the tech platforms to be more cooperative in terms of taking down some um, violent comments, let's say. Um, thank you very much, Emna. Um, we have one question. Um, I guess it's related to taking action. Uh, what can be done? Uh, what are the proposed adaptations to this reality? And what should be the goal at this stage when international support for these values are waning? So, I mean, if we take, um, take one action at a time, it would be not letting them down first, speaking up on their behalf, um, making sure they're not forgotten. Um, I so much believe in this power, the invisible power of when we speak about them, they will definitely end up here because they have no access to information, no access to news most of the time. Um, but they rely on us, um, and if we keep speaking and we keep addressing, and if we have an international support from different organizations and different governments, that would be good. Uh, that would be very, very good to, to their cases, um, and to avoid having more activists detained. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's so, um, at certain times, we feel so hopeless. Um, very hopeless um, when we say, for example, that Lujan has been detained for two years um, and we did not do much. Uh, we still feel we did not do much for her. And especially knowing that the person who um, observed her torture is free, um, it's unacceptable. Uh, but what we can do is we still have to, to fight and to talk about her. Um, and to ask and seek the help of international, the international community, a uh, community, sorry. Um, and it's it's uh, it's very important that um, organizations like Access Now and other organizations would be talking and stepping uh, and supporting um, those activists. It's very important also to support activists who are under threat right now, who are receiving. Um, like being targeted for their activism online um, by a hate campaign. Um, it's very important to give, a, give them uh, support, legal support, um, in certain cases, financial support or asylum in other cases. Um, but it's, it's not, let's not wait until they are um, arrested, let's say, let's, uh, let's be there for, uh, for them. Yeah, I want to build up on what you mentioned. I think uh, many regimes in the region bet on the waiting game that people will, you know, eventually give up hope. And uh, because the situation looks so hopeless, sometimes that they think, you know, people will eventually forget and um, they can get away uh, with their impunity um, and without being held accountable for their human rights abuses and, and violations. Um, so I guess, you know, we have also another question asking the same, uh, like, what can we do to, uh, to, to defend uh, human rights defenders and activists? And I guess you've, you've answered this question already by raising our voices and to continuously raise these issues whenever we can and in, in every venue and platform that we have. I have um, a second question also. Uh, from Kindel Salcisto, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. Um, does Mina also have trolls claiming that cancel culture is depressing mainstream views? If so, have you found strategies to push back? I would also want to add 
an additional question to this. We've witnessed um, in, in the beginning of this year, also governments using troll campaigns on social media to call for the arrest and the prosecution of certain activists that look at the, at the surface that they are just normal people, normal citizens asking for the prosecution of a certain individual for violating whatever um, they deem uh, should not be violated. So for example, public order or good values, et cetera. But actually these are being orchestrated by the by certain governments in order to legitimize the arrest. So, you know, that this, this is what people were calling for. Um, so do you, do you think that this is a, a pattern across the region or is it to, like to certain specific cases? The one I mentioned is, um, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. I can't recall the name of the activist at the moment, but she was detained, I think in April uh, this year, um, using this tactic. So um, I think it's a practice across um, certain countries in the region. It's not in every country. Um, but those trolls, um, if we take the case um, when it happens to be elections, we've seen that those polls there from other countries, they were targeting Tunisia, for example. And if we um, link this to, um, to the taking down of the certain um, Facebook accounts in Tunisia um, in May 2020, there was a link between uh, some accounts, not all of them, and, um, and a company, a um, a marketing and communications company in Tunisia that did the same more or less in the francophone um, countries in Africa. Um, they are using trolls um, and for the time being if we follow the political scene in Tunisia, trolls are uh, targeting certain figures who are not activists for, the, for this time, they are targeting political um, persona um, for um, like certain agendas, it's it's becoming something across the region. Um, in other countries like Saudi Arabia, um, amid the detention of Lujain al Hadloul and uh, at the time uh, Aziz al Yusuf, Iman al Najjan, and the other uh, men detained with them, uh, they were trolls um, using the I forgot the hashtag. Um, I think they were using a certain hashtag. Some of the, those accounts, they have bot behavior, but the others, they were like, they looked like normal accounts, but they were only used to attack the detained um, activists. And that did not stop with, it, with that campaign uh, against uh, Lujain al Hadloul and the others, but it continued to, uh, to target other activists. Um, we rely a lot on um, picking that behavior, being aware of it as civil society and addressing it, reporting those accounts and um, reaching out to the platforms um, with a list of the accounts and um, an action, a list of um, action points to, uh, to be done. Um, it's very important, I guess, um, if, we see that as individuals, as activists, uh, not only in the frame of, um, let's say, organizations or international organizations, but also as individuals, is to report those trolls. Um, it's our duty, I guess, uh, to make sure that we address this. There is no concrete strategy for that. We're not going, if they go low, we don't go low like them. Um, there is no, um, for the time being, there is no strategy to, to counter this, but denouncing that writing and uh, collaborating with the tech platforms. Um, I'm, I'm very skeptical on um, adopting laws in that sense because they can be misused um, in certain ways and in cer under certain circumstances against um, non-bot um, non behavior, for example. So let's use... Um, civic actions instead of uh, legal actions in that sense. Uh, but it's, it's very, very good to raise this question. Thank you. Uh, we have more questions coming in. So uh, we have a question from Tariq Radwan. 
um, he says, related to policing speech on the internet, countering smear campaigns and disinformation online requires massive time and resources. How can activists with limited means address the root problem? That's a very good question. Uh, and it's very, very realistic. Um, even, even Facebook failed in taking down certain um, comments or addressing or uh, picking certain campaigns. Um, and here I would uh, give an example from Tunisia um, of one of the activists uh, at the time, I think two years ago, she was targeted by a smearing campaign, um, a hate campaign. Uh, she's a gender activist. Uh, her name is Fidel Chakudin, and we had um, she she was subject to that campaign. But for two years, she did not notice that there was a huge amount of um, targeted posts against her that she did not um, um, pay attention to to them until she was physically targeted in the streets, and she. Um, she linked all of those incidents all together. Um, and of course, um, we, I guess, we rely, as she did at the time, on, um, on certain mechanisms like Access Now's help team, um, which they were there for her to support her in that campaign. Um, but also there are other organizations to do that. It's a amazing how they can do this work. It's amazing in a, in a bad way, not in a good way, of course, um, how they can allocate that time and money for that. So it's very, very difficult for us as activists to counter it. But if we work in communities, if we work all together, individuals, activists, and, and organizations, national and international organizations, it's very, very important we will reach a point where we can um, have like limit um, that kind of practice. Thanks, you mentioned the helpline. I think it's um, suitable to mention a few words about our helpline, uh, digital security helpline. We offer uh, free uh, service 24 seven a day, a week um, to uh, activists, civil society, organizations, journalists, and human rights defenders who need help with um, their digital security or under attack. Um, if you need that help, you can email at uh, help at accessnow.org and our team would be um, able to, to help you and provide assistance. Uh, we have a follow-up question um, from Kendall on the troll armies or troll accounts. She says, um, reporting those troll accounts, does it work? And are they responsive? And I, go, I guess they, um, uh, it refers to social media companies. So in some cases, yeah, they are responsive. Um, in other cases, no. Let's not take the, the current situation with the COVID-19, the responsiveness um, is way less than the usual. Uh, but in certain cases, we collaborated with the tech companies as uh, organizations, as um, not only one organization, but different organizations were working um, on the topic of content moderation and they were responsive to a certain extent. Um, I would love to see them more responsive and would, I would love to see them um, take the initiative of checking certain, uh, certain accounts with the experts, with the organizations who are working in the ground. Um, so for example, if I give the case of Facebook, they have trusted partners um, in certain countries. In, uh, for example, in Tunisia, they have certain trusted partners. And I would love um, to see Facebook reaching out to those trusted partners before taking the decision of taking down certain um, accounts, for example. So there, there would be limitation of the collateral damage, let's say. Um, but they should do more uh, because as they move, those trolls and those um, units, uh, at certain point, they are government units, they are uh, companies, um, startups who are using different mechanisms and they know how Facebook operates, they know how Twitter operates. 
um, so they can um, navigate those systems, let's say. Um, it would be good to keep, uh, to keep working, working with um, the people on the ground who have understanding of the situations happening in the ground. If we're talking about Tunisia, there are trusted partners in Tunisia, there are trusted organizations at national level that they can reach out to to work with. Um, in addition to the, to the governmental institutions uh, who would help in certain cases. Um, in other countries as well, um, I guess Access Now is a good um, key contact across the region of um, uh, the MENA region, uh, but in other regions as well. It's not, it's not only the MENA, this situation, we have seen um, different points um, common points between MENA region and other regions across the globe. It's actually very important to note because indeed this is not only special to the MENA region, unfortunately. Uh, we have one last question uh, before we end our press briefing um, from Tom. He's asking, is there anything in particular that men can do to support your work more? Um, and he says, I'm just baffled hearing your stories. I actually like this question. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, it would be men behaving as uh, as humans. It's like it's really, really good um, that you give the floor um, and you see the other um, how we are suffering. Uh, and it, uh, to a certain extent, if we take the case of men activists and women activists. Um, and given the circumstances across our region, only women would be arrested for the family values, for example. I, I bet it's, it would be really crazy from a government to, um, to arrest somebody for family values unless uh, that person is really, really, has really committed um, a crime. Uh, but it's like, it's very, very important to understand how women are being treated and not be part of uh, relying, relaying the information or the news about women, support women, uh, stop harassment, address it. When a man, when another man is talking and harassing women, stand by the women, don't stand by the men, by manhood, um, don't mansplain women online. Try to avoid that. This is very, very important. Um, and thank you, thank you so much for your question. Um, because we cannot do that as women only. I, I truly believe that men and women should work together um, toward a better understanding, a safer internet. Um, so thank you very much and bring more men like you um, to support women. Uh, and you won't be. Um, disappointed. Uh, this brings us to really uh, a, a good end to our uh, press meeting. I want to thank you so much, Emna, for all your insightful uh, conversation. And uh, before I end, actually, I would like to read a couple of lines from an open letter that, that we received from the sister of Ali Abdel Fattah, also a human rights defender, uh, Muna Saif, uh, and uh, I, I read, I quote, she says, both Sana and Ali are in prison. They and thousands of prisoners are at risk facing the combined danger of an epidemic and a brutal senseless regime. Please speak up on their behalf. Every voice, every voice counts. So indeed, every voice counts. Um, your voice counts, our voice counts. And in the coming days during RightsCon, we will be launching a joint civil society campaign in support of Ale and the many other prisoners in Egypt. Um, so if you are an organization and you would like to, re to join, please reach out to us. If you are an, in an individual, uh, please use your voice on social media or by writing to your representative um, to stand up in solidarity of those who are being uh, silenced behind bars. Thank you again, everyone, for your participation. I hope it was an eye-opening session for many of you. And um, enjoy the rest of RightsCon and take care. <laughs>